and we will get started. Good morning again. My name is Jennifer Carpenter, and I am a historian with TxDOT's Environmental Affairs Division. I'm joined today by my fellow historian and environmental program manager, Rebecca DeBrosco, bridge engineer, Jamie Griffin, and environmental coordinator, Becky Perkins. Today's webinar will feature stories about Texas bridges and explore the connections between bridges, history, and the environment. We'll also highlight how we protect historic bridges and the critters that call them home. Those things are slowly returning to normal. Many of us at TxDOT are continuing to navigate in the virtual world. So we appreciate your patience and hope that today's webinar goes off without a hitch. Before we begin a little housekeeping, this webinar does include PowerPoint presentations. So if you're only joining us by phone, we can get you a copy of the presentation upon request. If you have any questions at any point during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. You can also enter questions in the chat and send them to the host. We'll answer all of the questions at the end of the presentations. And then again, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the TxDOT website following today's presentation. Our agenda today will include an overview of TxDOT's environmental work and how you can get involved. We'll then move into our Stories of Texas Bridges presentation, followed by our Q&A session, and we'll wrap up and adjourn by 12 o'clock. And before we begin, I do want to point you to our webpage, um, all about the roadside chat. It features upcoming roadside chats and the links to previous webinars if you've missed them. So make sure you check this page to keep tabs on our presentations and see what's coming up in the future months. And with that, we'll move into the programming. Bridges are functional, practical structures, but that doesn't mean that they're boring. We want you to leave today's webinar knowing something you previously didn't know about bridges. And we'll start with a historical tidbit. Did you know that Texans used to purchase bridges through the mail? Before metal bridge manufacturers shut up, set up shops in the state, communities in need of a new bridge bought one from East Coast or Midwestern company catalogs. The bridge was shipped in pieces by rail and installed in place. At the time, these metal bridges featured the latest innovations, and many became notable landmarks in their communities. As bridge technology evolved, styles, and materials changed. Today, hundreds of historic bridges across Texas remind us of the ingenuity of their designers and about the communities that built them. TxDOT works to maintain and preserve these bridges for historic or for future generations, excuse me. And here's some more food for thought. When you drive across a bridge, did you know there could be critters living just below you? Bats, mussels, and other animals call bridges home. Here you can see bats emerging from the Congress Avenue Bridge in Austin. The bats are a tourist attraction, but their nightly flights and appetites help keep insect populations in check. Protecting wildlife that live in and around bridges is an important consideration TxDOT must address when planning a bridge project. In other words, the work completed must be done without harming these residents. Bridge projects help demonstrate TxDOT's commitment to the environment. Our planners, engineers, biologists, archaeologists, and historians thoroughly review bridge projects and consider questions like, will this project disrupt the quality of air and water, create higher noise levels, put endangered species at risk, or negatively impact a community and its resources? Our environmental work happens before any construction starts, and this is all part of the work that TxDOT does every day, but not many people know about it. The work conducted by our archaeologists, historians, and biologists is guided by laws like the National Historic Preservation Act and the National Environmental Policy Act. These laws require us to stop, look, and listen for cultural and natural resources before beginning construction on a project. Addressing resource concerns is one step in TxDOT's environmental review process that all projects must go through before construction. It's part of what we do that goes beyond the road. Cultural and natural resources are just two of several different resource types that we study. 
Such work is one piece of a bigger program that looks at a host of environmental impacts during project planning. And when we find, or if you, when our environmental work leads us to unique stories, we want to share them with you. So we create brochures, short videos, podcasts, posters, and more as part of our outreach and education campaign called Beyond the Road. But that's not all. Part of our program involves you, the public. Working with the public has helped us learn about the resources that are important to you. We invite you to join us and voice your concerns on projects and help us brainstorm ways to mitigate. We hope you will get involved. For more information, you can visit our website, text.gov, and use the keywords beyond the road. While TxDOT's environmental processes are governed by laws and regulations, we do have the opportunity to tailor them. And we do this by creating agreements with our federal and state partners that detail how we will complete our work. TxDOT is currently updating our programmatic agreement for historic preservation. This agreement will determine how, when, and what resources we use during our historic preservation process under Section 106. Once we complete a draft of the agreement, our partners sign off on it, and it becomes legally binding. Updating the programmatic agreement will improve the effectiveness of our historic preservation process by increasing the number of projects that do not require in-depth studies. Our goal is to focus our attention instead on the bigger projects that might negatively impact cultural resources. Plus, increased efficiency saves the agency and the public time and money. We've just launched a new web page where you can learn more about TxDOT's historic preservation program and the programmatic agreement. I'll put the link in the chat. We'd love for you to explore the page and take a short survey. Remember, public involvement is at the heart of historic preservation. Your voice matters. And if you want to help TxDOT with the preservation of historic sites, but you're not sure where to start, we've got great news. We're in the process of launching our very first Road to Historic Preservation virtual training platform. The site will include several training modules where you, so you can get involved in preserving our state's historic resources. You can get a sneak peek of these webinars when you visit our Planning a Successful Historic Preservation Program that I just previously mentioned. Again, I'll put that link in the chat shortly. We'll provide more details about the training platform in the coming months, so please stay tuned. In the meantime, check out our website to learn more about TxDOT's environmental work. And with that, that's our little overview of our historic preservation and environmental work. And we'll move into the, today's programming. First up, we have Rebecca DeBrasco, who serves as the Environmental Program Manager for TxDOT's Historical Studies Program. Take it away, Rebecca. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I really appreciate your help, and I'm excited to talk to you today about TxDOT's Historic Bridge Program. Before turning it over to our speakers that will go in depth more about our bridges in this state. Texas has the most highway and roadway bridges than any other state in the United States. And TxDOT is responsible for inspecting each bridge every two years. Out of those 55,000 bridges or so, about 500 of them are historic. TxDOT does not own or track all historic bridges in this state. Our historic bridge program only deals with bridges in what we call vehicular use, which are those on the roads open to car and truck traffic. We do not manage or deal with railroad bridges or pedestrian bridges or park bridges or bridges moved into new places. So there are probably more than 500 historic bridges in the state. Our historic bridge program has four different aspects, and I wanted to briefly highlight each one for you. The first one is the inventory. How do we know which bridges are historic? How do we know which of those 55,000 are important to, to maintain and preserve? We always are continually updating our inventory and list of historic bridges in the state. This map shows where all of the historic bridges are located. 
And this is available for your use through our Historic Bridges website. I will drop the links for you in the chat um, and I'll also have them at the end of this presentation. One of the cool things that we have that's part of this inventory is what we call our historic resources aggregator. And it's a mapping tool that has our project tracker, which is TxDOT's map that shows all projects planned over the next 10 years overlaid with our historic bridges map. So here, for example, is a zoomed in location for Aransas Pass on the coast. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more on this project. You can see where I clicked on the long red line and learned that TxDOT is planning the rehabilitation of a bridge on State Highway 361. The red line means that construction is already underway or will be underway soon. And I also note on here a yellow dot within that red line. Clicking on the yellow dot shows me that the bridge planned for rehabilitation is eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places, which means that it's a historic bridge. If you are concerned about TxDOT's plans for rehabbing the historic bridge, you can then reach out to us or to your local TxDOT office and learn more about what is planned. Next, TxDOT commits to providing best practices and continuing maintenance of our historic bridges in a manner that does not destroy any of the materials of the bridge or any of its important features like its railing. Some bridges undergo significant historic rehabilitation and maintenance, including lead paint abatement. And Jamie Griffin is going to go into much more detail later, later this morning about one of those rehabilitation projects. Other bridges just need annual cleaning to clear out the drains, um, remove any debris that's maybe caught in the bridge or in its supports from flooding events remove any vegetation or climbing vines from the bridge um, and doing all this stuff will help maintain and prolong the life of the bridge. In addition to the treatment, we also want to manage how we handle and prioritize these historic bridges. Because we have so many historic bridges in the state, we want to um, we want to be able to spend our time and money where it is the most useful and where we will have the most success in preserving these historic bridges. Traffic has changed a lot since most of these historic bridges opened. There are more cars and trucks. They are longer, they are heavier. In some places must deal with oil, gas or wind energy vehicles. Others are now, other historic bridges are now in the middle of cities that have high amounts of traffic. So how can we ensure that our time and funding and attention go to bridges that are in the best shape that can continue to serve Texas travelers for a long time? Well, we've developed many options to try and preserve as many historic bridges as possible due to the limited funding out there for these types of projects. When feasible, TxDOT will rehabilitate historic bridges, especially those that serve on our federal and state highway systems. Often, we use the bridge as part of a pair of bridges, like the one shown here. You can see at the bottom how one, one of the pairs has the historic truss and one is a more modern bridge. Other times, our historic bridges may serve as interstate frontage roads. We also try to find new owners and new homes for bridges through our historic bridge legacy program. Some bridges can easily be moved and put in place in parks or along hike and bike trails. In other cases, we leave the bridges in place, but maybe they become um, pedestrian bridges only open to um, walking and biking. Some cities like Rockdale, Texas have multiple historic bridges in their parks and trails. In fact, TxDOT has found new owners for almost 100 bridges through this program. But how many of you knew all of these things that we do? How many of you knew that we had so many historic bridges in Texas? Well, we know that's a problem too. 
So the last part of our program is education. We created a place to tell the stories of Texas Bridges. This web page is through the Esri Story Maps portal. A lot of these stories on this portal, TxDOT wrote once we lost certain historic bridges. We talk about how counties once ordered bridges from catalogs, the first trust bridge company in Texas, and different styles of bridges. We hope to add more stories as we continue through our program. So, for instance, I wanted to show you 1 of these stories. This story is about the works progress administration. 1 of the new deal era federal programs. The WPA improved roads and bridges across Texas. And this was 1 of them that they installed. We had to remove though this metal truss bridge outside of Goodlett, Texas. And this is another way we can help tell this story. And let you know about the importance of our historic bridges. We also try to talk about our historic bridges in places where they once were located. This photograph shows panels about the Waxahachie Viaduct and transportation in Waxahachie. Um, this is done in anticipation of the plan to demolish the historic concrete bridge, which you can see right now in the background of this photo. So, while the bridge may ultimately go away because the concrete based on tests and other engineering studies is actually kind of crumbling from within and is really unable for us to rehabilitate. We can still have these stories about the importance of the bridges and the crossings to the city and people can continue to learn about the different bridges across the state. Most recently. We developed a lot of resources about Texas's historic bridges built after World War II. TxDOT did a survey of thousands and thousands of bridges built between 1945 and 1965. And we found about 100 of those bridges to be historic. As a result, we are telling the stories of those bridges on websites, through videos, and through social media. We've done this in partnership with the Texas Historical Commission, and you can see here a snippet of the research that we've done that is on the THC's website. We've also developed some fun lesson plans for teachers and parents, quote, informal educators like museum or library staff or other organizations to use to talk about Texas's post-World War II bridges. Each lesson includes PowerPoint explanations and activities for elementary and middle school students. They all have multidisciplinary activities, so these aren't just history related activities, but also include science and math and physics and geography. In addition to the interpretive panels and this other digital history work that we've done. TxDOT just completed a partnership with the Texas Historical Commission and the Bullock State History Museum for a workshop series on STEM in history museums. We trained over 400 museum volunteers and staffers on how to incorporate more STEM, more science, technology, engineering, or mathematics in their history museums and to offer multidisciplinary programs and exhibits to teachers and students. These workshops use text.resources, resources, for example, and for hands on activities, including how to research and work around historic bridges in Texas. We plan to continue to seek ways to prioritize our funding and our time to preserve our historic bridges in the state, as well as ways to tell stories of our historic bridges like this webinar. I hope that you found these resources interesting. And please visit our websites. We have a whole lot more information than what I just highlighted here, including videos, success stories, additional training, and resources for owners of historic bridges. Now, I'm glad to turn it back to Jennifer so we can go on to the next presenter. Thank you, Rebecca, for all that great information. Um, next up, we have bridge engineer Jamie Griffin. And you want to turn your camera on, Jamie, show, show everybody that you're with us. Um, Jamie joined 
TechStot and two, well, I'll back up a little bit. Before that, Jamie is a graduate from UT's architectural engineering program. So all you fellow Longhorns can give her a little hook them here, I guess. <laughs> and she joined TechStot in 2006 with the bridge or 2005 with the bridge design program. She worked primarily on historic truss rehabs and she's moved to bridge management, the bridge management section in 2016. So with that, I will turn it over to Jamie. Hello everybody. Oops, I'm not seeing the presentation just yet. Um, you should be the presenter. There you go. You're moving it. There, there we perfect. go. Yeah. Little technical difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, y'all. Well, I am here, uh, as Jennifer said, to talk about the rehabilitation of the uh, historic Colorado River Bridge in Wharton, Texas. So, a um, little more background about myself. Um, I've had the great pleasure to work or to develop some. Um, Historic bridge rehabilitation plans for a number of historic trusses across the state, including the Wharton Bridge. Um, of course, if uh, anyone asks me which one is my favorite, I have to say the Wharton Bridge is definitely that one. Um, but admit a little bit of bias here. I'm actually from Wharton, so I have a bit of a history with this one. Now, um, in this presentation, I'm going to go over um, a little bit of history about the Wharton Bridge, and then we're going to get really into how a product bridge rehabilitation project is initiated, how the rehabilitation plans are developed, and then lastly, how that project is supported during the construction process. But before we get started, I wanted to talk a little bit about the different types of trusses that make up the Wharton Bridge. Um, first off, we have what's called a Warren Pony Truss. Um, this is a short sand type truss. It doesn't have that overhead roof structure um, that you see on some of the other trusses. Um, and this particular detail sheet was pulled from our Texas State Highway Department standards for inclusion in the Wharton Bridge plan set. Now we also have what's called a Parker through truss. Um, this one does have that overhead roof type structure. So when you cross the bridge, you're going through the truss. Um, this one, like that Warren Trust, was pulled from the Texas State Highway Department Standards Library for inclusion in this plan set. Now, the next one we have is a, called a Pennsylvania through, through truck. Um, this one, a, unlike the other two, was a custom design. So this uh, Pennsylvania truck was designed specifically for inclusion in the, um, or, or specifically for that crossing there at the Colorado River in Wharton. Now, this bridge was designed, we use these Pennsylvania trusses, so there's extra long spans. You can see that this one here, 320 feet. So this is a really big truss bridge. Now, the reason that Pennsylvania bridge is so special is because there just aren't that many of them left in the United States. Now, the ones that are left um, in the U.S., uh, there's only a very small handful of them that are still in vehicular service. Um, we're lucky here in Texas, we actually have two, uh, one in Waco and then another one here, this one in Wharton. Now, the Wharton Bridge was con constructed by the Austin Bridge Company and completed in 1930. have a nice photo just after its completion there in the bottom left. And um, it is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Now that we have an idea of the different types of components that make up the truss or the Wharton Bridge, I have a nice diagram that shows how all those components fit together. Um, as you can see, it's a very long bridge, um, over 1,100 feet long. Um, it starts with a whole bunch of concrete approach spans. There's, there's lines off the one side of the photo, followed by that Parker truss span. Um, and this diagram is great. It really emphasizes the difference in scale between that Parker truss. It's 150 feet long. It's not a small bridge but it's kind of dwarfed by its neighbor there, that 320 foot Parker truss span. And then if you look just past that Parker truss, you'll see what looks like kind of a slightly thicker line. That's your Warren Pony truss. And then you have a couple more uh, concrete approach spans uh, just to the other side of that. Now, despite its size, that Warren Pony truss played kind of an outsized role in the initiation of this rehabilitation project. And the reason for that is during one of our routine inspections that Rebecca mentioned, um, the inspector uncovered a whole lot of corrosion along the bottom portion of the bridge. And the thing about corrosion, what it does is it eats away 
the steel material. That steel material is what provides the bridge with its strength. It allows it to hold up itself and the weight of traffic. So as the bridge corrodes, you're losing strength. And it was enough of a concern here that we had lost enough uh, material that there was a concern that the bridge could no longer safely carry that traffic. And so for that reason, it was closed to traffic in 2013. Now we know we have a project. We have a problem. We've got a closed bridge that the citizens of Wharton can no longer use. So what we need to do now is develop a rehabilitation plan to get that bridge back in service. Um, so now I'm going to go through how we start off a project and then jump into how we develop those details. So when we have a project that we want to rehabilitate, we kick that off by conducting what's called a condition survey. A condition survey is differs from an bridge inspection. The purpose of a bridge inspection is uh, for the inspector to go out, document any damage that the bridge might have, quantify that damage, and tell us where it's located. When we do a condition survey, what we're doing is the design engineer goes out, takes that information from that inspection report, and then reviews it uh, or views those locations of damage, this time with an eye for how we're going to complete a repair. Now, the things we're looking for when we're looking at these damaged locations is um, things like technical feasibility. Is it going to be possible to make that repair? Um, for instance, uh, whenever you change a part of a bridge structure, that change will cascade throughout the bridge structural system. So you have to make sure that whatever change you make can be supported elsewhere in the bridge. You also have practical considerations. Rebecca alluded to this as well. Um, old bridges are built for old cars, and those are uh, quite a bit smaller than some of the traffic that you see today. So it may be that the types of vehicles that are using the bridge now just don't physically fit on the, um, within the constraints of the uh, historic structure. If that's the case, rehabilitation might not be a good option. Fortunately, that was not the case here. Um, so now we can talk a little bit about the specific um, rehabilitation details that we developed to complete this project. We're all going to be bridge engineers for just a little bit. All right, so we're going to start off that Warren Trust Band. This is the one that resulted in the bridge's closure. So we know from that inspection report, we have a lot of corrosion on the bottom part of this bridge. So we go out, conduct our site visit, our condition survey, take a look at the bottom part of that bridge and go, yep, sure enough, we have a bunch of rust there. What are we going to do to fix it? Well, fortunately, this is actually a pretty easy repair. We can just take that old rusty member off, put a brand new one on that's the same size and shape, and you're good to go. Unfortunately, what we discovered when we looked at this a little bit more closely, if you look at that picture right there, you can see that there's those few members with that tiny little gap in between them, and then you see a giant rust spot. And then next to that, you'll see this tiny little plate that's sandwiched in between those members. Well, the effect that that plate has is that it uh, became kind of like a reservoir. So it retained moisture right there up against those steel members and became a catalyst for corrosion. Um, now, uh, keep in mind, the uh, city of Wharton is on the Texas uh, Gulf Coastal Plain, and so there's a lot of rain, a lot of moisture, a lot of humidity. So you have a lot of opportunity for water to get onto that plate. But because those two members are so very close together, there's no airflow there, and so there's no opportunity for all that moisture to get dried up and cleared up. And so once you have moisture there, it just stays there. It creates that um, uh, corrosion, and that corrosion just sits there and propagates. So unfortunately, that is not a thing we can fix because that is part of how this trust was assembled. So it's something that um, will always be a problem. Now, whenever we do a rehabilitation, one of the goals of that rehabilitation is not just to fix the problem that we see, but to keep that problem from happening again. So in this case, with the way that trust was assembled, we didn't really have a way that we could fix it in a way that it would last for a long time. So the decision was made here that we would replace this worn trust span with a new concrete girder span. Now, this is where the importance of community feedback comes in. Um, the citizens of Wharton were incredibly engaged in this project, from project initiation all the way through to construction. Um, and being from Wharton, I can attest to the fact that this bridge is super important to the community. It really is part of the fabric of the community, um, right next to the old historic downtown. And so maintaining the original appearance of that trust was very important to the community. So what we were able to do 
is remove those load-bearing elements from that truck. And we took out the floor beams that held up the deck, took off that deck, and we're able to put that new concrete girder span in between the vertical or portions of that original truck. So the effect that gave is that we were able to provide a lasting restoration with a modern concrete beam bridge, but still maintain the original appearance of that bridge for aesthetic purposes. So now I had mentioned earlier, whenever you make a change to a structural system, that change is gonna propagate, gonna um, cascade throughout that structure. So whenever we added these really heavy concrete beams in place of that much lighter truck span, what we needed to do was provide some strength, some extra strength to those bridge supports because those bridge supports are now being asked to carry that much heavier weight. So to do that, what we did is add piling up underneath those bridge supports. That piling gave the extra strength that was needed for that bridge support to be able to carry the extra weight of those concrete beams. Now, another challenge that we had um, pretty well throughout the structure um, is impact damage. If you've ever driven across one of these bridges, um, you're aware that they're very narrow. I remember driving across it many times um, with, in, with my dad in our old truck. And uh, if you met another car coming the other direction, it was, uh, it was pretty hairy. Um, so you can imagine if you had a two diesel rigs coming across the bridge at the same time, there's just nowhere for them to go. So as they move um, to the outsides of the bridge, uh, they will have the opportunity to impact those truss members, which of course can um, cause this impact damage. In addition, um, the city of Wharton, or the entire Wharton area, is a farming community and they also have some uh, oil and gas activity as well. Um, these uh, types of activities have very large oversized vehicles that just simply don't fit on these old bridges. Um, so in a previous project, the way this problem was solved, again, Rebecca mentioned this in her previous um, presentation, is that you construct what's called a companion bridge. So as Rebecca showed, you build this new bridge right next to that existing bridge. And that has the effect of removing that oncoming lane of traffic and placing it on that new structure. It also removes the physical constraints from the side of the truss and from the roof structure of the truss. Um, so that the um, oversized vehicles like your farm equipment can travel on that newer bridge without those physical constraints. So that did uh, a lot to prevent future impact damage, but of course we still have the impact damage that's there that's gonna require repair. So impact damage actually does have an effect on the strength of certain truss members depending on how they function. So what we need to do is, since that strength has been reduced, we need to restore that strength with a strengthening plate. Um, so we take a plate and bolt it to the original member and that'll um, restore that original strength. However, looking at this member, you can tell there's no way we're bolting any sort of anything to that thing. Um, so before we can bolt a plate to that, what we're gonna need to do is straighten out the dents and beams with a process called heat straightening. That restores the member's original size and shape so that we're able to bolt those strengthening plates to that member. Now, so we've fixed the old impact damage. We have taken that, um, or all of that opposing traffic and put it on another, um, on that neighbor bridge. But what we haven't done is eliminated the um, ability for the traffic that still is on this bridge to um, create additional impact in. Reason for that is that original curve is so close to the side of that truss that if for any reason a vehicle were to veer towards the edge there, they could still impact those truss members. So to solve this problem, what we ended up doing was taking a uh, new bridge rail and placing it inside of that original curve. That had the effect of narrowing that lane further, forcing that traffic inward and getting it away from the trust members to prevent future, uh, most future impact damage. Now, a uh, practical um, uh, story here, uh, it actually worked really well. Um, shortly after we opened the bridge, maybe a couple weeks, I got this uh, a picture from my sister. Um, a local gentleman tried to drive a very large piece of farm equipment to across the uh, bridge. And fortunately for us and the bridge, it did become lodged in between those new approach rails and was not able to create any impact damage. Um, this is again, very fortunate if you're familiar with this type of equipment, there is no dimension of that size. 
rise or um, up and down that would have fit across that bridge. So we were very fortunate to have avoided any impacts there. Now, the next problem I wanted to talk about, which is uh, probably the most complex problem that we um, encountered on this uh, structure, and this applied to both the Parker and the um, Pennsylvania trusses, was with the gusset plate. Um, you all may be familiar with the term gusset plate from the very tragic collapse of the Minneapolis Bridge um, uh, a very long time ago. Um, while the gusset plate wasn't the entire reason for that collapse, an underdesigned gusset plate was part of that. Um, in our case, uh, fortunately, we had plenty of strength in those gusset plates to resist the weight of the bridge and traffic. But as we saw in previous slides, as you get corrosion, that strength gets eaten away. Um, so we had um, gusset plates that were beginning to lose strength as a result of corrosion. So we know we need to address this in some way. And that can either be addressed through a repair or through a replacement. But um, gusset plates are incredibly complex members um, of a truck. It's where a bunch of different members frame in to one very confined location. So if you were to go through and do a replacement by, say, adding a strengthening plate to get to that impact damage, um, what you would do is alter the geometry of that connection. So in the case of the Wharton Bridge, you can see in that photo at the bottom there, we have some members that are framing into the outside of the plate and others that frame into the inside. So there was no side we had available to add that strengthening plate. The repair really wasn't an option in this case. That forces us into replacement. However, again, those gusset plates are super complex members. Um, just as you have all of those members framing into that connection, well, all of those members are carrying weight. They are carrying weight into the gusset plate. That gusset plate takes it and carries it off to the next member and makes the whole bridge come together and function kind of like one giant beam. Um, so, of course, if you take that gusset plate off, you're reducing a tremendous amount of that bridge's ability, of its strength, to carry that weight from traffic and of its own, uh, and its own weight. So replacing one is a very complex procedure. Um, what, how this would typically be handled on a smaller span is you would take that uh, bridge, pick it up with a crane, move it off somewhere, and then uh, put some shoring up underneath around those gusset plates so that you would take that weight off of the gusset plate and then be able to safely remove it without compromising the structure. In this case, we have a 150-foot span and then that really big 320-foot span. So just picking it up and moving it somewhere else is really not an option here. Um, so what that means is that we have to conduct a very careful analysis to see if there's any way this bridge can hold itself up while we reduce its capacity by removing those gusset plates. And that's exactly what we did. Um, we did conduct a very rigorous structural analysis to determine exactly how much weight we had to take off of that bridge so that we could, so that it could still hold itself up under that reduced capacity without the gusset plate there. Um, and it turned out we were very fortunate that once you take traffic off, traffic weighs a lot, and you take that heavy concrete deck off, that that gave us just a little bit more capacity than what we needed for that bridge to hold itself up and maintain its integrity while we remove that gusset plate. So we were able to remove each gusset plate one at a time on all the structures, a very careful and a very tedious process, but um, it worked out very well and we did get good restoration product. Now, removing the deck actually had a twofold purpose here. Not only did it allow us to unload that truss enough to be able to replace those gusset plates, but it also let the sea stop that we wouldn't otherwise have access to. There's a lot going on up underneath the truss bridge, as you can kind of see here. And a lot of that stuff is really concealed by the um, deck being there. It's hard for us to get a really good solid look at what may be going on with some of these other members. Um, as a design engineer, part of your responsibility is to anticipate um, problems that you really can't see. So we do develop details based on experience from other rehabilitation, uh, other rehabilitation projects. They generally have similar issues. We develop details for inclusion in the plan set, but just to make sure, we also um, write in the notes and we tell the contractor, hey, contractor, once you get that uh, bridge deck off, you need you to give me a call. I'm going to come back down there. I'm going to do another condition survey. And I'm going to take a much better look at it now that I can see it better. Make sure that that plan set I put together has captured all the damage that we can see. 
So that brings me to the final phase of our project, which is construction support. Um, and you'd think you, you'd finish your design plans, your work is done, it is not, you're barely halfway through. Um, uh, construction support is a good, good portion of a rehabilitation project. And of course, having a good relationship with your contractor is just absolutely critical. Um, it, as or much as uh, the issue with the depth, where you know there's a lot of parts that are concealed because you just can't see them very well. The same is true um, once you get your contractor out there. He installs these work platforms. You can see that metal sheeting that we're standing on. Those work platforms allow you to get real up close with that truss and take a really good solid look at things that you wouldn't otherwise get to see. So sometimes new details will arise that you'll need to address um, while you're uh, when you have better access. Also, a very thorough contractor is super important um, because, um, again, when they are doing those repairs, they may come across something that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to see, which is exactly what happened here. I got a call from the contractor. He said, hey, I think there's something going on on this bottom part of the truck. Mind if I take this plate off? Of course not. Go for it. Um, takes the plate off, and sure enough, there we have some corrosion that we wouldn't have otherwise seen. We were able to get that corrected, get it fixed and again, have a better, more lasting restoration. Another thing we need to address um, during construction is um, clarification. Uh, as a design engineer, when you're working on this project, you've been staring at the same project for over a year um, at, at times. And so all of the details that you've put together to um, complete a repair make perfect sense to you because you've been looking at it forever. But as someone who just shows up to the bridge and can, you know, lay eyes on those details for the very first time, they may not make as much sense to them. Um, so, uh, for example, here, this is one of the impact damage repairs that we did. Remember, we're adding that strengthening plate. The only place that would fit was on the outside of that member, in between the member and the crisscross things that you see there. They're known as lacing. So when you add that plate in between there, that has the effect of pulling that lacing out by the depth of that plate. And of course, you might have to chase that all the way up the entire member and remove all that lacing, but it's not something we want to do. So we devised this complex puzzle system of little shim plates that when applied in the right places, in the right sequence, would make it so you didn't have to remove every single bit of this lacing. But again, it didn't, it made perfect sense to me. It was a little less clear to the contractor in the field. So again, good lines of communication. They gave me a call that, hey, I don't know what you want me to use your fuse zone. Come on out and let's take a look at this. And so we drove back down to the site. I spent about 15 minutes with this gentleman here explaining exactly how those little shim plates were supposed to be fit in there. And with a quick 15 minute conversation, we solved the issue and he was able to complete the rest of those repairs without any trouble. So now we've got all of our repairs done, we're entering into the finishing touches. Um, that's gonna be cleaning and painting, getting rid of any uh, remaining corrosion and then putting a nice paint job on it. Um, on a rehabilitation, your paint job isn't just to make it look pretty. The purpose of that paint is that it is the first and best defense against your corrosion. And as we saw in the previous slides, that corrosion is enemy number one of historic truss bridges. Um, so it's really important to get that good paint system on there, get that protective system so that you can stop that corrosion from recurring. Now, um, Rebecca mentioned this as well, but your old paint does have, or often has hazardous materials on it. And of course, new paint uh, has contaminants as well. So when you do this work, it must be fully contained within a giant so we tent the entire bridge. You can see on the top photo, we're just now beginning, or contractors getting ready to deploy that tent. Bottom photo is a different bridge um, that shows work from inside of that tent. And then lastly, I hadn't talked much about those concrete spans, but as I said, in the impact damage, it was um, throughout the structure, including on the concrete ones. So we did end up doing a lot of patching to restore their, uh, that um, concrete span's original function and appearance. Now, um, we did have a lot of design challenges. Uh, unfortunately, um, we, one of the big challenges we encountered during construction, uh, the city of Wharton was very hard hit by Hurricane Harvey. Um, flooding was a huge issue and in, in, in inundated uh, much of the town. Um, there were a really uh, difficult time for the city of Wharton. Um, of course, we were uh, doing painting at the time, so the contractor did have to scramble to try and remove a lot of that painting equipment and get it to higher ground. Um, we're not, however, uh, we did not 
end up removing that working platform. So just to give you an idea of, of the magnitude of this flooding, um, a picture I showed you before there on the left, you can see that red arrow pointing to the um, uh, work platform. On the right, you can see there's flood waters. They're right up against that um, work platform. We actually did have some debris come downstream and uh, hit that platform, twist it up underneath the bridge. But we were very fortunate that we didn't have any damage as a result of that. Now, to end on a happy note, um, I had mentioned that the city of Wharton, that the citizens were involved in the construction process. You're probably wondering how on earth a citizen gets involved in the construction process. Well, how they get involved is by baking, baking an enormous amount of cookies. So, uh, the, or a bunch of citizens of Wharton got together um, and, and to expressed their gratitude to the bridge workers for restoring this really important bridge. They baked just a whole ton of cookies and other sweet treats, packed them into some goodie bags, and distributed them to the um, bridge workers that were on site. And so now you have a completed bridge rehabilitation project. What are you going to do? You're going to throw a party. So, um, in lieu of the typical uh, bridge, uh, or excuse me, a ribbon cu cutting ceremony, the uh, city of Wharton ended up throwing an enormous party to celebrate the completion of this really fantastic rehabilitation project. Um, and it was such a success that uh, it became an annual event. They still have these. Um, so, if you are in the Wharton area, I would recommend that you look it up. It's uh, always a pretty good time. Um, and with that, I'm going to conclude my presentation. I really appreciate y'all's time. If you do have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer them once the rest of the presentations are complete. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Jamie. That's awesome. Um, party under the bridge. I mean, I want to go. That sounds really fun. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to switch gears and move a little bit more into the natural world um, with our last speaker, Becky Perkins. Uh, Becky Perkins is a very new member to the Natural Resources Management Team in the Environmental Affairs Division. For the past six years, she's been the Environmental Coordinator and District Environmental Quality Coordinator for the San Angelo District. So take it away, Becky. Thanks, Jennifer. I appreciate the introduction. And Jamie, that was a really exciting talk. I have so many questions about the bridge if other folks don't have any, so I can just take up all the time at the end with that. Um, I appreciate the chance to speak on this uh, during this roadside chat, and I'm really excited to talk about wildlife, or as the historians say, the bugs and bunnies portion of the talk, which I'd be offended by if I didn't really like bugs and bunnies, so it's totally applicable. So let me see if I can get this going. Today, I want to talk about TxDOT and wildlife, and specifically with bridges. I want to start with a wide um, overview and then work our way quickly down to actual bridge work that we've done in the San Angelo District. So just to start off, TxDOT maintains 73,000 miles of roadway on our system. And as you can imagine, that includes a lot of interactions with wildlife across the state. And we manage our interactions with wildlife for two main reasons. One, for the safety and enjoyment of our traveling public. We want you to be safe and avoid wildlife collisions and also enjoy your view as you drive through this beautiful state. So we've got a wildlife management uh, wildflower program going on as well. Also, we are obligated to consider our impacts to the natural resources world during construction and our roadway maintenance projects. So there's a suite of federal regulations that we are obligated to comply with, and I threw some of them on this slide. Um, there's a lot, I know there's a lot of words there. What I wanted you to key in on is that there are a lot of these that we follow. They range from the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA and the Endangered Species Act, some that you might be more familiar with, to some pro uh, regulations that you may not be familiar with, like the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act of 2007, or the Executive Order on Invasive Species. So we cover a lot of different interactions and we manage those in several different ways. So narrowing our focus down even more to bridges and wildlife, because this is a presentation about bridges, I'd like you to key in on the fact that by default, bridges are sensitive areas for our natural resources. So at first, they're used as habitat by some of our wildlife. We have bats that will roost in them or breed in them. We have birds that will build their nest on them. I'm sure you're all familiar with the swallows that fly up and around a bridge when you drive over it. But we even get birds like uh, owls or ravens building uh, nests 
under our bridges as well. Additionally, bridges are an intersection between a riparian area and our transportation system. So we're going to run into sensitive species that are aquatic in nature, like mussels or fish that we need to protect and require specific protections. We also run into sensitive areas of, of plant life, like wetlands, which are fragile and can be disrupted. And they're also protected by federal regulations. And then there is a suite of water quality concerns when we're working in or near the water in which we need to manage our sediment, we need to manage any of our pollutants that may run out and ensure that we're protecting that water as we do this project. So it gets complicated quick near these water resources, but TxDOT does our best to manage them as we move through the project. All right, so I am going to speak about two projects in the San Angelo District and just to work you down there, Texas is a large state, and to manage that, TxDOT divides up the state into 25 different districts. We have all sorts of habitats and ecotypes, everything from desert to mountains to the beach, and in, I am in the San Angelo District. So it's just east to the west of Hill Country. We have 15 counties, and it's mostly the Edwards Plateau and Rolling Plains ecotype. Just in our district, we have almost 1,400 on-system bridges. Those are bridges that we run into during our roadway construction projects, our bridge maintenance projects, um, and all of our, our, most of our traffic projects, we're, we're intersecting with a bridge. And as you go east, that becomes even more of an issue where things get even wetter than they are here. So to talk about those, I would like to first move on to bridges as habitat. So, Bridges may serve as habitat for several species, but one of those species would be the Mexican free-tailed bats. We have eight bridges that TxDOT manages across the state that function as maternity colonies for bats. One of those, the most famous in the, the state is the Congress Avenue Bridge, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. It's beautiful and scenic in downtown Austin, and it can host up to one and a half million bats on a really good night. We have a maternity colony bridge in our district. It's maybe slightly less scenic down there on the bottom right, but we're still quite proud of it. It's about a mile from our district headquarters where I'm talking right now, and it can host up to 200,000 bats in a night, um, averaging between 100 to 150 during the breeding season. So we are proud of this bridge, and we're excited to have that as a feature in our transportation system in the district. So this is a wildlife, wildlife talk, and I get to talk about wildlife. No one can stop me. So I'm going to tell you a bit about Mexican free-tailed bats. They are a medium-sized bat, about three and a half inches long, weighing 7 to 12 grams. And if you don't think in grams, I don't. That's about the weight of a small to medium-sized strawberry. So pretty small little guys. And they will roost in bridge joints. Um, bridge joints can mimic the habitat that they seek in the wild. And so they make good use of what we provide as habitat. They roost particularly well in box beam bridges. So if you look at that top right hand picture, that is the bottom of Foster Road Bridge, which is the maternity colony that we have here. And you can see that there are, now forgive me, my engineering skills don't exist. So there are concrete boxes that run along the bottom of that bridge. That's what you drive over, um, covered by pavement on top. Now, when they're building the bridge, they don't want those boxes to be right next to each other because then that doesn't give any room for them to expand and contract when things get warm or cold. So they leave a crevice in between. Well, that crevice serves as excellent habitat for bats to wiggle on into and to have and raise their pups. So the bats here are partially, well, the bats in Texas are partially migratory. The ones that are in our bridge will migrate down south for the winter and they will come back in the summer to breed and, and roost and take advantage of all the insects up here, which brings another point. They are excellent invertebrate pest reducers. We like our bats because they, in a night from this bridge, the bats can remove almost a ton of invertebrates. And a lot of those are moths that are pretty rough on farmers' fields. So we really like having them around. Also, they're a fun attraction in town. These guys are really exciting to watch emerge and return to the bridge. Also, they're adorable. I don't know if you can see the little ears, but they're just cute. So we like our bats um, and we like our bridge, but an issue was brought to my attention in 2016 by Dr. Lauren Ammerman, who is a bat biologist at the Angelo State University that's right in town. 
she had a student, Stephanie Martinez, who was studying the population trends of the Mexican free-tailed bats in this bridge. She was looking at historical data and how the population changed over seasons. She didn't see much of a change over seasons. It was the bats would show up in the, the warm season and leave in the very cold seasons. What she did notice is that there was a relationship between the presence of rainfall in a week to the presence of bats in the bridge that week. And in particular, that relationship was negative. So the more rain, the fewer bats that were in that bridge. Looking into the situation more, they realized that the bridge joints were leaking. So when it rained, water was coming through those crevices and pouring down on top of the bats. Now, summer in San Angelo is warm. It can be up to the hundreds, right? Um, for us, getting rained on might be nice. For a very small bat, that can be deadly. It can reduce their, their body temperature so low that they use all of their energy up to stay warm and thermoregulate. If you are a volant bat, or a bat that can fly, which most can, that's not that big of a deal. If your roost leaks, you leave and you find a drier roost and warm up for the night, right? That's why they were seeing the reduced population size when it rained a lot. If you're a pup, a baby bat that can't fly and you're already small and a little bit weaker, that could be a deadly event. So what they were seeing is as the rain came through, if the rain hit at certain times during the pup development, they were having large incidences of mortality with the pups. That's not something that we like. They obviously didn't like that. Um, as stewards of our natural resources, we didn't like that either. And so I spoke with the district leadership and we came up with a plan on how we could help mitigate this problem. So to prevent bat mortality at the bridge, we needed to find a way to waterproof it. We worked on finding funding for this, for getting the project into a set of projects already so that the bridge could be fixed quickly and in the season in which the bats were present. The plans included um, milling down the pavement that's on top of the bridge, resealing the joints, adding a fabric under seal, and then sealing that with a waterproof sealant, and then repaving the top of the bridge. So basically doing everything we can to close up whatever gap the water is coming in through. And we had a pause in the construction schedule because the rest of the work finished midsummer, of course, when all of the baby bats were there. So we had to wait until they migrated south for the winter. Unfortunately, I wish the story was a bit happier right now, but unfortunately, our plans didn't work. We conducted this, and then after, there was, after the construction was completed, I went to the bridge during a rainfall event and water was still pouring through the joints, which didn't make sense because we thought we had tackled the issue. So I asked the area engineer if we could borrow a water truck and an operator to systematically check where the water was getting through on the bridge. And we figured it would be the abutment. It was not the abutment. We figured it might be on the sidewalk. It was not the sidewalk. It wasn't until we dumped water directly onto the pavement that it started pouring through those joints. So something went wrong in our engineering or the implementation of it during our fixes. So unfortunately, our bridge is still leaking and it's an engineering problem at this point that we're looking into and we're hoping to find the funds and the ability to address it in the future. But I am proud of our district for putting in effort to protect these these bats because they are important to us and they're important to the city of San Angelo. I'm gonna switch on you a little bit here and move from bats to mussels. We're gonna discuss the uh, South Lana River State Park Bridge, which is on Park Road 73 in the South Lana River State Park, which is in Junction, Texas, or just outside of it. About 10 years ago, Texas Parks and Wildlife came to us and asked us to design a replacement for the current culverted crossing that is across the South Lana River when you first come into the state park. Now they wanted us to do this for a few reasons. And if you look at the picture on the slide, you can see that there is, oh, I might be able to draw on this. Um, right here is the structure. And you can see that it is functioning as a, um, as an almost bottleneck for the water moving through the system. So the, the river is wide and slow. It hits this crossing and is funneled through, which isn't great for fish habitat because fish cannot pass through that very easily. If you're an angler, you know that this, this river holds Guadalupe bass, which is a great sport fish. 
and it's a species of greatest conservation concern. So it's one that we want to protect and foster good habitat for. Additionally, it's bad for river health. When you narrow down that river, you're speeding up the water, and that can cause erosion concerns downstream. If you look at the bottom right-hand side of the, the river there, you see that bank is really steep. That is being eroded at a quicker rate than we would expect, and that is due to that crossing. Lastly, park connectivity suffers from this crossing because it's so low that even a very small flood, which they get a lot of down there, overtops the bridge. When that bridge is overtopped, no one is going in or going out of the park, and it can be a dangerous and certainly inconvenient situation. So we decided, or we started working on plans, and we're going to help them out. Now, any project that touches or gets into water in my district requires a freshwater mussel survey. I gave this talk to my mom the other day, and she, by the end of it, she was like, okay, but what's a mussel? So just in case you're not sure what a mussel is, a mussel is a bivalve, and it looks a whole lot like an oyster. And I didn't put a picture in here, but I just happen to have some in my office. So they are good eating, and they sometimes every now and then make a pearl for you. But they're also vital to healthy river systems. So mussels are filter feeders. They remove algae and particulate matter from the stream. They're called the vacuum cleaners of our stream. Without them, river quality degrades um, or degrades. There are also several environmental regulations that protect mussels that we need to comply with. And some of our permitting requirements for work in streams require that we minimize harm to aquatic systems. So being good stewards of our natural resources as well, we want to make sure that we're finding these mussels and getting them to safer habitats before we go in and remove and reconstruct a bridge because that can be pretty um, invasive to where they are, they are located. At this park, um, we started, we conducted a mussel survey in 2016 and found no mussels other than an invasive Asian clam. Well, then the project languished a bit in design when the designers and Parks and Wildlife were deciding what kind of bridge type they wanted to use or go with. So in 2020, when we started back, we realized it had been too long and we needed to conduct another mussel survey, just in case any had moved in, especially during those 2018 floods when so much changed in the river system. And sure enough, our consultants found two specimen of the Texas fat mucket, which is state listed as threatened. So if the, if the mussel is state listed as threatened, that's something we can work with. We have TPWD approved relocation methodologies that we do to go in, we find them, we remove them, put them in a safer place, and then we can move forward with our project. The concern is that this species is listed to go under the Federal Endangered Species Act. So this is moving from state protection to federal protection. And that has major implications for the project during construction if it gets listed while the project is in construction, meaning that we're out building a bridge, all of a sudden the species is listed and we know we have it in this river, that's gonna stop us. And we're gonna be on hold until we can get the right permits from Fish and Wildlife Service. Normally, if we have an endangered species or a threatened species moving into a project, we will consult and coordinate with Fish and Wildlife Service seeking a biological opinion which is basically a letter from Fish and Wildlife Service saying that they agree with our project, they agree with our conservation and mitigation strategies we're going to implement before, during, and after that project, and they agree that our project is not going to jeopardize the continued survival of that species. This is a long process and a vital one for us to move forward. We cannot move forward without that. If a species is a candidate for federal listing, they cannot give us a biological opinion, though, because the species is not listed. What we can seek is a conference opinion. And a conference opinion from Fish and Wildlife is the same as a biological opinion, just for species that aren't listed yet. And it, there is a clause towards the end saying that if the species is listed during construction, we can request that our conference opinion be turned into or adapted into a biological opinion thus reducing the construction delays from up to maybe even a year or more to maybe a few weeks is what we're hoping. So this is what we wanted to go for, is the conference opinion, which is a new process for TxDOT. We haven't done this before. Um, and additionally, there was one more complicating factor. 
Normally, when we coordinate with Fish and Wildlife Service, we do so as a federal agency. We normally have federal funds, and under NEPA assignment, we get to go through a Section 7 consultation with Fish and Wildlife Service. This project, being from Parks and Wildlife, only had state funding. We did everything we could to try and find a federal dollar, but it was not to be found. So in this situation, to coordinate with Fish and Wildlife under a Section 7 consultation, we needed to go through a federal nexus, and we were able to do so with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So they were functioning. Um, we were applying for a nationwide permit from them. They were then working with Fish and Wildlife on our behalf for that permit to make sure that our work in the stream was compliant with what Fish and Wildlife Service would want for a potentially listed species. I know that's a lot of permitting mumbo jumbo. The main point is we took a already complicated uh, consultation and added another federal agency to that, which doubles the emails, doubles the calls, doubles the meetings. Um, so it, it got interesting pretty quick. Definitely now the first time of a coordination like that we've done at TxDOT with this. And of course it was with a tight timeline. We had under a year to get this coordination done or Parks and Wildlife would lose their funding for this bridge, which was unacceptable. So we did everything we could to make sure that it happened. We, um, the, what got us through this process was open and consistent communication with all of the agencies that were involved. So that's TxDOT, Parks and Wildlife, the Corps of Engineers and Fish and Wildlife. We did our best to maintain healthy relationships between all of the agencies. And TxDOT's been putting a lot of effort into having monthly calls with Fish and Wildlife and the Corps of Engineers to discuss our ongoing projects to make sure everything is moving along well and we're doing everything we can to make sure the process is, is going smoothly. Lastly, we lucked out in getting a very excellent consultant for this job that provided uh, high quality technical reports and was able to get in the field and do the job quickly. And I'm, I'm really happy to say, as of last week, our conference opinion was received, and we also received our Army Corps of Engineers permit. So the project will be environmentally cleared in time, and we won't lose the project funds. We'll be able to move forward. There's going to be a follow-up muscle survey that will be conducted this year, and then hopefully construction will start on this bridge by the end of, end of this year. So, I've covered two specific interactions that we've encountered in the San Angelo district, um, talking about the bats that were in the bridge, using that as habitat, as well as mussels and the complexity of wildlife permitting, how that can slow down and complicate the environmental clearance process, because we do our very best um, and we stay within the boundaries of the law at TxDOT. So we, we comply with all of these federal and state regulations. There are many other exciting aspects of wildlife and bridge interactions. Uh, two that are down in the FAR district include wildlife crossings and mitigating pelican collisions on bridges. And so if you get a chance to listen to anyone speak about those, I highly recommend you take it because it's some really cool stuff. What I want you to take away from my portion of the talk, however, is that even though our priority is providing and maintaining a functional and safe transportation system, we are invested and excited to protect and work with our natural resources in the state. So with that, um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them later on. And if you want to email or give me a call, my, my information is down in the bottom of the slide. So I'll hand it back now. Great, thank you so much, Becky. Um, I did not know what a fat muck it was, but now I do. So that's something new I learned today. <laughs> Gives them the worst names. It's so there's a pimple back. Um, I just it's poor little muscles. Oh man. Okay. Um, if all our presenters want to hop on video, we've got some great questions that we can answer. Um, if you have questions, do you've got lots of time to still submit them in the Q and A box. All right. I think I will start with Rebecca. Um, we got a question, where do you get the information for all those text panels that you guys put up at historic bridge locations? Yeah, that's a yeah, that's great a question. question. Um, 
We get them from kind of standard historical resources. We do research at libraries. We research um, in uh, newspaper articles because a lot of times, as Jamie showed even today, when a bridge is built or reopened, everyone um, likes to celebrate it and note it. Um, we get information um, from county commissioner minutes sometimes because counties built bridges. And then we also have a really robust um, archive here at TxDOT. We have plans and drawings, as you saw in Jamie's presentation, for almost um, every bridge and road that TxDOT owns. Some of them that TxDOT used to own but doesn't own anymore. We have those plans and drawings and sets too, so we can learn a lot from those. We also have a very great photo library where um you know that we have photographs from the past 100 years um or more actually we we're over 100 years old now 105 i think <laughs> of texas highway department text dot history and you know just kind of using all of these different resources um we go out there and we can pull together um stories of bridges stories of um transportation systems and road systems and um, also work with our local partners at local libraries and museums and archives to get all that information. Um, great, yeah, there's lots of good information out there. The hunt sometimes can be the challenge, but kind of following up with that, Rebecca, we've got a question about the Historic Bridge Legacy Program. Is it only for current tech stop bridges? We have a listener um, who let's see, has a stretch of the Dixie Overland Highway Bridge that's been closed to vehicular traffic for several years and it's not accessible to bikes or pedestrians. Um, so they want to try to relocate it maybe to a park or somewhere else and they think that ownership was transferred to the city but they haven't tracked it down. So how does that program kind of help with those instances? Yeah, that's a great question too. But really the Historic Bridge Legacy Program is only done when there are TxDOT funds in the project. So um, TxDOT does fund projects that are open, like I said, for bridges and crossings that are open to vehicular traffic, open to truck and car traffic. Um, we do work with our local partners who may own bridges because TxDOT doesn't own every bridge in the state. Um, we have counties and local governments and cities that own and maintain bridges and we work with them to um, make sure that their bridges remain safe and um, viable for public use and vehicular use. And that, through that project is where that historic bridge legacy program comes into play. So we're able to leverage federal highway money that's part of our highway bridge program um, that is then able to um, particularly save um, a historic bridge, especially if there's a new use for it or a new owner for it that can take it over um, once it's no longer able to be used on the road system. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. Um, got a couple of questions for Jamie. We'll start maybe with an easy one. A little softball question for you. Um, are gusset plates only on riveted bridges? Oh, Jamie, you're muted. Let's unmute you. There we go. <laughs> I think I unmuted you. <laughs> My phone was muted too, so we should be good now. <laughs> okay, um, for the most part, yes, your gusset plates are gonna be on your riveted bridges. Um, the, there's another type of bridge that's called a pin connected bridge. While you may have plates there, they're not usually referred to as gusset plates, they're called pin plates. Um, but the gusset plate, like I showed you, is just gonna be on those uh, riveted bridges. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, another question for you, Jamie, um, how long do these bridge rehab projects take? So for your Wharton project, start to finish, what was the timeline? So that's going to depend a whole lot on the um, the size of the bridge and then how complex the repairs are. Uh, the Wharton one was um, really one of our longer ones. It started in, let me see, I wrote that down, um, in February of 2017. And it was scheduled to open in early October. I think they did actually, um, but, but they were still doing a little bit of work on it. And of course, that was complicated by Hurricane Harvey. Um, but in all, it, it was a little over a year and a half to get that one done. But keep in mind, those gusset plates, we have to, there were a large number of them and we had to replace them one at a time. So that, that, took quite, that, that was a pretty long process on that one. 
Sure. Um, and then after these fantastic rehabs are done, how long does that repair work last? So when would TxDOT maybe need to go back out and fix up the bridge again? Well, there's different levels of repair. Um, the goal for these major rehabs, like what we did at Wharton, uh, we, we certainly don't want to go out and replace gusset plates every 10 years. Uh, <laughs> so we're hoping that, again, that's a whole new piece. Those pieces should last um, about as long as the original one did. So we should be able to get a lot of life out of that one. Um, but what we do need to do, and uh, Rebecca talked about this some of her presentation as well, is we need to do um, continual maintenance on things. Um, and you saw in those gusset plates all those little nicks and crannies. That's what collects all that stuff, the you know, road poop and stuff like that. And that stuff is what causes corrosion. So as Rebecca said, it's important to go out and clean out those joints on a regular basis. Um, so if, you have, if you're a local government and you have a, a bridge that you're uh, dealing with, I just really want to recommend that um, keep those joints clean. That's what's going to give you the bridge the most life. Um, now, uh, so anyways, sorry, I got a little got a little distracted there, um, <laughs> advocating for historic bridges. Um, but uh, like uh, what, what we do need to do on a regular basis is that maintenance. So the, um, something like cleaning the joints you're gonna do on a yearly basis. Uh, something like repainting, we're looking to do that every 10 years or so. Paint doesn't last forever. So we do need to get out there and do that more regularly. But those major repairs like we did on Wharton, that we, we should be, we should not be touching that again for quite some time. Um, I, I take a wild guess at least 25 years. All right, cool, good. Um, kind of maybe a joint question for both Rebecca and Jamie. Any records for uh, when the first bridge was built in Texas? <laughs> I don't oh, know. Wow. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> maybe like the first truss bridge, because you know there may have been timber bridges before that that communities kind of put up, you know, out of need. I don't know. That's I a, think one that's of the a... bridges was probably a uh, one of the old ferry type bridges, right? The the mm -hmm. and ferry point. Um, but I, I'm afraid I don't really know. <laughs> I mean, we don't we don't really know either. But there are some really old bridges that you can still see. You know, like the suspension bridge in Waco. Uh, Texas is um, no longer open to traffic, but it's a pretty old crossing um, and is you can walk across it, although I think they were closing it to do some rehab work on it. There's also um, a really old truss bridge that is from 1884 that um, is no longer, you don't drive on it anymore, but it sits next to the new bridge um, in Clifton. Texas um, in Bosque County out in like the rural kind of west of Waco. Um, it's also a super rare type of metal truss bridge. Um, but probably some of the oldest bridges in Texas are probably railroad bridges. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they would have been built before any highway bridges really. Cool. Good job, Rebecca. That was pop quiz for you. Um. <laughs> Um, question for you, Becky, and maybe Jamie too. Do nesting animals cause damage to these bridges? I, I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. <laughs> I know there are some studies that have shown that the large colonies of bats are generally not destructive to the bridges and that there is a lot of concern about the guano that is produced, but it typically does not introduce um, dangerous levels of bacteria into the river where it does happen. But that's probably the extent of my knowledge on damage from animals to bridges. Jamie? I could give you kind of a non-answer. I know we did a big study on this, and uh, since we are still um, including bat habitats on our bridges, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and step out and say that, no, I don't think this will, the damage is significant. Um, and uh, I've been running around uh, underneath this uh, bridge here on Congress Avenue for a while, and, you know, being a bridge nerd, I always look up and take a look, and I looks fine to me. Uh, <laughs> so, no, I, I don't believe that they, they cause any, um, any significant damage. Okay, great. Um, another question for you, Becky. What kind of native vegetation restoration is done after a bridge repair project? So, Textot has a standard seed mix that we apply, and it's district specific based on the habitat that we have in the area. If there are, so that that seed mix applies to certain types of soil and the general location. 
if we have a very sensitive area that we've impacted, there are times where we will work directly with parks and wildlife or fish and wildlife, depending on what kind of species are there, to go back with different kinds or types of restoration in the location. But it was very project specific. Most of them use the standardized seed mix. Okay. Um, and then a couple questions, I'm going to pose them together and either Jamie or Becky, you can tackle them. Um, are new bridge designs meant to meant to attract or repel wildlife? And the second one is, let's see. Um, well, let's just start with that one. Yeah. So are new bridge designs meant to repel or attract wildlife? Becky, you want me to take that one? Sure, <laughs> you design them. <laughs> tag team, tag team. <laughs> um, well, uh, the answer is not really either unless someone asks us to. Um, they, they're definitely not meant to repel uh, wildlife. Um, uh, they, they do, uh, we do on um, request uh, provide wildlife habitat, like what Becky was showing in her presentation, there's box beams. Um, if we really wanna make a habitat, then we, you know, if that beam is appropriate for that location, then we can use that. Um, Something else I kind of wanted to add though is that uh, even on, if you don't have that box beam structure that makes a good habitat for, and if I am stepping all over this, <laughs> so tell me when I'm Fine. wrong. <laughs> but uh, the, um, uh, the, the box beams make good habitat, but we also actually have little bat houses that we can put under the types of bridges that aren't great uh, habitat, like the normal beam bridges that you see um, with the more open structure. So we do add those sometimes. Um, and uh, one other thing I wanted to mention that's uh, really super cool. Um, we also have a uh, wildlife crossing. Um, so uh, the, these are these totally unglamorous bridges that you will never see in, unless you are a bridge nerd or you designed this thing. Um, but we have a, what's called a ocelot crossing and uh, a, a couple of other different types of wildlife crossings that are um, basically, they're, they're just, a, a, just an old box culvert. You've probably seen those um, a handful of times, but they do provide an area for those uh, for that wildlife to safely cross through. And in the case of the ocelot ones, and Becky, you're gonna have to help, help out on that. But, you're doing uh, but, great. <laughs> I don't need to be here. <laughs> <laughs> that that ocelot one is designed specifically with stuff ocelots like. So again, that's where I really don't know. I know we have them. I don't know what ocelots like. <laughs> <laughs> so the the wildlife crossings, and I'm also I'm kind of speaking out of turn here because I haven't worked too much with them. But we did have an issue with ocelots being hit on the road. That was one of their main causes of mortality, and so that's what triggered these wildlife crossings. And ocelots um, don't like to get their feet wet. Cats, just in general, don't like to get their feet wet. So down there, the culverts tend to be wet. So they would put in um, crossings in which they can walk on top of. or And they also like to put in natural bottom crossings on the culverts too. So there's lots of modifications that you can add to a culvert so that it still functions to carry the water through the system and not pile up on the road, but will facilitate the movement of animals through that system. In some areas, they've put up fencing to direct the wildlife to those culverts, but we try not to do too much fencing because it's expensive to maintain and it gets hit and it's, it can be difficult. But if we focus on putting those wildlife crossings in natural areas where the wildlife is funneled through already, we've got videos and pictures of many, many, many species using these wildlife crossings. So it's not just the ocelots, it's the bobcats and the raccoons and the deer and you know, the, the bunnies and bugs. So it's, they're, they're pretty great. Yeah. They're pretty yeah, I've seen some video of the ocelot and other animals using it. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, put a know, link in the chat for one perfect. of the videos. There you go. They're perfect. really neat. Um, and that kind of leads me to another question, the one that I was blanking on. Are, do you know if there are any plans to build more of these wildlife crossings? Are you aware of any? It, as far as I know, it's an initiative that we're trying to get off the ground to maybe start including these modifications when we're modifying or changing out bridges, but it's still very much so in the planning phase. But we, we like the idea of keeping wildlife off the road to make them more safe, because even if it is a raccoon, that you're going to hit, a lot of folks will swerve to avoid the raccoon and that makes an incredibly dangerous situation. Um, so anything we can do to funnel the wildlife off the road is important for the safety of the traveling public as well as for the adorable critters, so. Sure, keep everybody safe. 
Yes, right. Human and right. wildlife alike. Jamie may um, have something to say about that too. I don't know. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> do you, Jamie? No. no. Want okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I do have a question for you, Jamie, that came in. Um, on the Wharton Bridge, were the rivets replaced with rivets or were bolts used? And if bolts were used, did the contractor use regular bolts or did they use a type that has a similar head that looks similar to a rivet? Um, well, uh, we try to maintain the original appearance to the extent possible. Um, there there uh, has been some concern about the rivet head bolts. Um, so depending on the application, uh, we would go back with, uh, with a regular old plain bolt, um, high strength bolt, so that it was uh, uh, it had the strength that needed to um, do what it needed to structurally. Um, but in locations where it, it, the bolt had less of a strength need, we were able to use a few of those uh, rivet head type bolts. However, um, the back of the, the rivet head only appears on one side of that bolt. The back half still um, has a normal bolt shape. Um, unfortunately, we were not able to use rivets for this particular project. Um, there's not a lot of folks left that know how to do riveting. And so there was a concern about being able to make sure that we received a quality product. Great, thanks. Uh, we do have, uh, going back to our pop quiz about the oldest bridge in Texas, we have someone in the chat that says he considers the Mission Espada Aqueduct, a National Historic Landmark, the oldest bridge in Texas. It was built around 1740, so we have a long history of bridges here in the Lone Star State, so thank you for that historical tidbit. Um, okay, pivoting back to contemporary times, um, for Becky on the South Llano River Bridge, how did you solve the narrowing issue? So, oh, I, I guess I didn't specify. We're going back with the span style structure. So instead of having that being a culverted bridge, which narrows it down, we're going to pull that culvert out and then raise the bridge by several feet so that it's further, it, it meets the ground further away from the river. And that way the river can widen out on its own and start moving it in its own path. So that's that's our plan to not be so constricted anymore. Sure. Okay, we did get a question about um, just brochures or other info about cool Texas bridges. So again, Rebecca shared some really great resources on websites you can look and look at fun pictures or even the map. Um, there are some other resources online. Yeah, I would encourage you to check those out. Check out the links that Rebecca put in the box so that you can drive around state and take selfies in front of all these cool old truss bridges and other fun sites. Um, so a good reminder for that. Um, let's see, Jamie, when building bridges, does TxDOT try to use box bridge construction for potential bat habitat or do they avoid box bridge style? Uh, we do not avoid them. Um, if they're asked to be used specifically for habitat and the beam is appropriate for that or for that location, then we, we will absolutely try to accommodate that. Um, that being said, uh, I kind of heard that little caveat there, the appropriate for that location part. Um, box beam bridges aren't always a good fit for the type of traffic that you'll see in a location. And so um, they are a little bit limited in where we Jamie, we have one out in, or a bridge replacement project that's scheduled in the San Angelo district. And I requested, and I think they're looking into going back with box beam bridge on that because it's in a great location for bats. And I, I think it would work out really well. And I think the box beams work in that location as well. So we'll, we'll see, I'm hoping it'll work out. Well, that's fantastic. <laughs> cool. All right, um, Rebecca, for a question for you, any news on the Corpus Christi Harbor Bridge? Um, sure, uh, the Corpus Christi Harbor Bridge is um, a massive truss bridge that was built in 1959 and it's in the process of being replaced. And um, the Harbor Bridge is a historic bridge. Um, it The big truss as well as the um, spans coming up to it, which were early uses of certain materials um, in bridges after World War II. And um, because the bridge will be coming down, will be demolished, um, TxDOT, through our environmental process that Becky talked about, 
um, you know, we, we come up with ways to compensate for the loss of that bridge and we're doing a massive project um, for that, which is pretty exciting. So we are working on developing a video that has historic footage of the actual bridge construction. Like that was one of the things Texad had in their archive, you know, where, where I was talking about that. We had this, um, you know, 16 millimeter, I think, footage of the construction of Harbor Bridge and its opening. And so we're able to use that um, in this video. We are developing a, um, a little brochure that people can just take home with them. And we're also do doing a big partnership with the Corpus Christi Public Library to develop a little traveling exhibit that will be able to go around to all the library branches, as well as any schools or churches or community centers that are interested in it on the Harbor Bridge itself, as well as its impacts on the surrounding communities, such as the North side neighborhoods and North beach outside of Corpus Christi. Um, those traveling exhibits will also come with um, educational activities that librarians can do with um, the kids that come visit, uh, you know, uh, and help them learn more about engineering and history and bridges and things like that. The other exciting thing about um, this whole package is that it's going to be fully bilingual. It's going to be fully in English and in Spanish. One of the first times that um, textile historians are really trying to make um, a product like this accessible in more than one language. Um, as far as the actual construction project, it's unfortunately continuing to go in fits and starts and having delays. And actually, I just reached out to our Corpus Christi team yesterday to ask them when they are projected to have the actual Harbor Bridge be demolished. And um, they're they're not sure and they haven't, they need to get back to me, but, um, you know, we're building the new bridge first. So all of the traffic can be moved over to that before we demolish the Harbor bridge. So, um, that is the status of that project. And I hope that, um, you know, we hope to have a big kind of community celebration when all of this work is done to unveil everything, um, and talk about the bridge. And so I hope that, um, you'll be able to attend those of you who live on the coast and in the Corpus area. Another party under the bridge opportunity, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Cool. I'm glad you said that actually, because, um, you know, there is going to be parking under the new bridge because they have, they've incorporated a big, um, walk and bikeway on the bridge for all the crazy people that want to, that want to go up it and, um, not in a car. That is not me, but, um, on the, on the parking areas under the bridge for access to those, um, trails, there's also another place where we're going to do some more interpretation. Um, like I had talked about with the Waxahachie bridge, you know, panels and stuff like that. We're going to put that there. So, um, we're going to force the early morning exercisers to learn about some of the history. So <laughs> we're going to do that too. <laughs> okay. Sometimes learning history without intending to is the best way for you to appreciate it. So yeah, no, that that's awesome. Okay, let's see. I think that's addressed most of our questions. We've got some got some great questions. So thank you all for being so engaged and asking. And I really think this is a great webinar. You can see just one resource or one structure type of bridge and all the resource concerns that are related to it from history to engineering to mussels and bats and pelicans and everything coming together. So it's a great way for you to understand, better understand TxDOT's work with environmental concerns and how we, how it takes a lot of people to get one bridge project going and it's not always just engineers. So thank you again for attending. Um, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. I'm not seeing any last minute questions. So I do want to remind you, um, thanks again for joining us for this webinar. Um, I do want to encourage you to check out our new Planning a Successful Historic Preservation Program webpage. Um, that's where you can learn more about Section 106 and you can take a short survey to let us know what types of cultural resources matter to you most. Um, you should also receive a survey about this webinar after we end. So take that too to give us your feedback on ways we can improve or maybe future topics you're interested in learning more about. You can always contact us with any questions. You can see the contact information below. And if you do visit our website, just use keyword beyond the road to check out some really great resources and learn more. Um, with that, thank you panelists for joining us today. Great stuff. Um, I know people really enjoyed this one. So with that, again, this will be recorded. If you want to come back and visit it later, it should be posted on our Beyond the Road webpage. Um, and until next time.
Take care, everybody. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks for having Thank us. You.